Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the kickoff of the Economic Liberty Lecture Series uh, for the spring semester here. Uh, a, this is a joint project between the Future, uh, Future Freedom Foundation and the George Mason Economic Society. My name is Bart Frazier. I'm program director at the Future Freedom Foundation. Uh, for those of you familiar with us, we're a nonprofit libertarian educational foundation. Um, We've got uh, a lot of new things going on at the foundation. If you've not been to our website recently, please do check it out. Uh, it is brand new. It is beautiful uh, and uh, very interactive. A lot of videos, uh, a lot of social media, so please go check that out. Uh, we have a whole slew of new columnists, the most recent being Stephen Horwitz, who I'm sure that many of you are familiar with. He's now writing a bi-weekly column called The Calling. Um, we will be at the Students for Liberty International Conference uh, next weekend. Uh, that would be a week from Saturday with a conference including Bruce Fine, Sheldon Richmond, uh, and moderated by Jacob Hornberger entitled The War on Terrorism, uh, Civil Liberties, and the Constitution. Um, our new Vice President and Editor Sheldon Richmond uh, will be starting uh, webinars online, free webinars, so please check our website uh, for information on those. Uh, also, our president, Jacob Hornberger, is giving a free lecture series here at the university on law and economics. Uh, again, please check out our website in the event section for details on that. Um, like I said, this is our, our spring kickoff, kickoff here with uh, Timur Koran. We have two more lectures coming up. Uh, in March, we have Stephen Landsberg, uh, and in April, we have David Primo. Um, so, I will now hand it over to Rachel Ellis from the Economic Society. Uh, please give her a warm welcome. Evening, everyone. My name is Rachel Ellis. I'm the president of the Econ Society. The Econ Society is a student organization committed to the personal, professional, and academic development of all students interested in the study of economics. The GMU Economic Society organizes lecture series, discussion sessions, and other interactions between professional economists and students. If you'd like to learn more about the Econ Society, you can come speak to me or any of the other officers after the event. They're all in that area. Um, Tamor Karan is a professor of economics and political science and Gorder family professor in Islamic studies at Duke University. His teaching and research draw on multiple disciplines including economics, political science, history, and legal studies. Unfortunately, there will be no social hour tonight, so thank you and please enjoy the lecture. <coughs> Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Thanks to the Future of Freedom Foundation and to uh, the GMU Undergraduate Economic Society. I've, uh, over the years, come to GMU many times to, uh, to give talks. In fact, I've spoken in this room uh, several times and always had a, had a good time, always benefited from the uh, discussions. Uh, so look forward to uh, your reactions. Uh, I plan to speak about 50 uh, minutes. So you all know that uh, countries of the Middle East are by and large run autocratically. Uh, there are a few democracies, most are uh, very new, all of them are imperfect, uh, uh, and we don't know if they will uh, last. Uh, it won't surprise you that according to global indices of political performance, the Middle East stands out as a poor uh, performer. And you see this in figures here. If you look at the last column, these are the free Freedom House uh, civil, civil Liberties uh, figures. Uh, you look at, uh, compare the OECD, the club of uh, rich industrialized countries, uh, and compared to the Middle East, you see the Middle East does uh, very poorly. Uh, same if you compare the rule of law index of the World Bank for the Middle East and OECD. Uh, the Middle East also stands out as a relatively corrupt part of uh, the world. Again, you can see the comparison with the uh, OECD. 
Uh, now, there are variations with the Middle East when you break it into uh, its major components. Uh, Turkey comes out, uh, does better according to all these indices and other similar uh, indices. But I'm going to focus not on the differences within the region, but on the commonalities. A commonality of the Arab world, Iran, and Turkey lies in the dominant religion, namely Islam. On that basis, a dominant view uh, outside the region, but also to an extent inside the region, uh, is that the political deficiencies that you see reflected in these uh, figures are linked to uh, Islam. Now, we don't need to go beyond this table to see one reason for doubt. The gover governance problems that you see in the Middle East are replicated in some other parts of uh, the world. Just compare the Middle East with uh, China, and you see that uh, they're not, uh, China looks a lot more like the Middle East than it does uh, the OECD. Africa is also a very poor uh, performer. Uh, scholars familiar with, the, uh, with Middle Eastern political history often will brush off the suggestion that there is a link to uh, Islam on additional ground. Uh, yes, Islam has been associated with so social and political repression, but governance under Islam traditionally uh, in the Middle Ages was uh, shallow in the sense that most public goods were provided uh, privately. Uh, also, in the Middle Ages, classical Islamic philosophy grappled with the challenge of binding the uh, ruler and with promoting the rule of law. On that basis, some writers say that if rule of law is weak in the Middle East today, this is in spite of Islam, not because of it. Noah Feldman of Harvard Law School recently uh, uh, wrote a book uh, making this case a rather controversial uh, 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 book. Uh, and he says we have to look elsewhere, not to, uh, to Islam. There are further reasons to be uh, skeptical. Iran is ruled today by ayatollahs in a repress repressive manner, but its political performance was not much better under the Shah's uh, repressive secular regime. And in the Arab world, countries ruled by more or less secular dictators have not had better political records. Uh, secular dictators have repressed opponents and stayed in power indefinitely. Cumulatively, the three dictators overthrown, North African dictators that were overthrown over the past couple of years, Ben Ali Mubarak and Gaddafi, had been in office 96 years, an average of 32 years. And of course, there's another secular dictator, uh, Assad of Syria, who's uh, uh, fighting tooth and nail to keep uh, his uh, position. Islamists have not been a part of the coalitions, or were not a part of the coalitions of the toppled secular dictators. They were kept out of government, they were denied a voice, they were repressed. For another example, in Turkey, uh, political power passed uh, about a decade ago from secular parties to uh, a mildly Islamist party, the AK Party. Uh, basic political indices have improved in the meantime, not, uh, not worsened. So these are all reasons to be quite careful in linking Islam to political performance. Nevertheless, there are reasons to take seriously the alleged link between Islam and political underdevelopment. Islam gave the region a common economic legacy through Islamic laws that were enforced until quite recently, until at least the 19th uh, century, in some places until later, well into the 20th century. And these laws contributed to holding the region back economically. The region's economic trajectory might have influenced its political trajectory as well because economic and political processes interact with one another. Economic institutions, and this is a point that I'm going to uh, develop, uh, also serve political uh, functions. If, in fact, 
Islam did affect political development, let us say through economic institutions, and that's the case that I'm going to try to make, the legacy of Islam would constrain all governments in the region today, not just Islamist ones. It would affect, the legacy would affect constraints facing all rulers, regardless of their particular views. So political performance as measured by rule of law, or as measured by absence of corruption or civil liberties, would be limited because of inherited institutions, regardless of the politics of the moment. It won't matter to overall performance, the types of statistics that we get from Freedom House and the World Bank Rule of Law Index, it won't matter whether power is in the hand of secular politicians committed to a secular lifestyle or Islamist polit politicians committed to uh, Islamization uh, of their uh, countries or of their region. The identity of the repressed people, of course, will depend on who's in power. In Egypt, under Nasser, under uh, Mubarak, who was toppled recently, uh, Islamists were repressed especially harshly. Lots of people were, lots of groups were uh, repressed, but Islamists were uh, were singled out for special treatment. Secularist freedoms are in jeopardy now as the Muslim Brotherhood tries to gain full power, it's try, as it tries to solidify its power. The brothers are already trying to tighten blasphemy laws, uh, but of course, the repressive character of government is not gonna change, okay? So under Turkey's secular regimes in the 1920s through 1950, Islamists were persecuted for sedition. Islamists have been in power for the past decade, as I mentioned. They moved cautiously in their first two terms. They won a third term through the ballot box recently, and they've become bolder. Uh, they've put 140 generals in, uh, in jail. All of them, without exception, are supporters of secularism. Uh, they've also put 70, more than 70 journalists in jail, and uh, the, uh, these journalists are overwhelmingly uh, secular. Notice what I'm saying. If the basic institutions of a country or region depend at some deep level on, on a religion, the characteristics of even an impeccably secular regime in that country will reflect that religion. The secular regime might have done away with symbols of uh, uh, religion, but it will have inherited its institutions, which it can't change at will. Religious regimes, regardless of their precise agenda, regardless of what they say about various uh, uh, freedoms, regardless of what they say about corruption, they will also reflect past manifestations of the religion that they claim to uh, represent. So here's how I'm going to uh, proceed. I'm going to discuss how three specific economic institutions, all of them based on Islamic law, helped to shape political development in the Middle East from the rise of Islam 14 centuries ago uh, onward. Uh, in the early years of the religion, an attempt was made to cap taxation and to make taxation predictable. Had the attempt succeeded, private property would have become secure, but this attempt failed. The failure to regulate taxation induced a search for a wealth shelter. A distinctly Islamic uh, form of the trust was developed called the waqf. I'll say much more about this. The waqf became Islam's device for providing public goods while also sheltering assets from the state. Waqfs were politically powerless and they did not provide political checks and balances and we're still living with the consequences. Meanwhile, the private commercial sector was persistently atomistic and stagnation of the private commercial sector made it difficult for capital owners to form coalitions capable of bargaining with the state. Now the upshot is that the Middle East reached modern times 
without an effective civil society. Transplanted institutions have started to change things in the region, but the past still matters enormously. So I'm going to return. What I'm going to do is go way back in history, go back to the early years of uh, the religion, and then toward the end of my talk, I'm going to return to uh, the uh, present and in the light of the history I give you or the interpretation of history that I give you, I'm going to try to interpret uh, what is happening in the Middle East today and the chances for uh, successful democracy uh, over the short run. So let's step uh, way back. Islam emerged in Arabia in the 7th century. Its holy book, the Quran, emerged during the lifetime of the religion's founder. Remarkably, the Quran instituted a system of predictable taxation to finance eight specific categories of expenditure on the part of the state. And this system was called zakat. Muslims, except the very poor, were required to pay zakat at rates that depended on the forms of their income and the forms of their wealth. The rates were mildly progressive, and the rates were low in comparison to the typical rates of antiquity. If you compare the rates of early Islam in the seventh century, the rates instituted with those of the Romans, the taxation by the Romans, by the uh, Babylonians, Assyrians, and so on, you find that the lows, uh, the rates are uh, quite uh, low. And the rates were meant to be fixed. Basic rates on gold holdings, on camel herds, a few other forms of wealth were specified early on. Now, in mandating the well-off to make fixed annual contributions to the state's uh, Islamic state's governance, the zakat system also imposed a ceiling on obligations, on individual obligations to the state. As such, it might have provided the doctrinal foundation of a social contract involving equity in taxation, predictable taxation, and also limited governance. Now, as this system was falling into place, Islam spread rapidly beyond Arabia and became a world religion within a matter of decades. Outside of Arabia, Chad basically had a desert economy, the economic base was different among the places where Islam spread first, or Syria, Egypt, Iraq, and uh, Iran. In the course of the adaptation process, the fiscal constraints imposed by zakat vanished. What exactly happened? Influential groups in these captured territories demanded exemptions on one category of wealth or another. And the categories of wealth were, were different. These were, you did have urban uh, economies uh, here. Uh, relatively urban economies. You had different crops uh, grown. Rud rulers needed to build alliances, and they bought many of these groups that were demanding exemptions, they bought them off for pragmatic reasons. So the zakat system, over a matter of 40 or 50 years, began to look like the U.S. tax code, essentially full of holes, okay? So having curtailed the coverage of zakat, these influential groups that got the exemptions then began to treat as sacred the specifics of the restricted system that gave them, exempted their own income, their own wealth from uh, taxation. They began to treat the restricted system as sacred rather than the initial <laughs> principles of taxpayer equity predictable taxation, and limited government on which the original system was uh, based. In the process, they choked off 
state's capacity to raise revenue through the religion's own taxation and expenditure systems, through the, system, the, uh, the uh, religion's own fiscal systems. So states ruling in the name of Islam were forced to raise, just nothing else for survival, they were forced to raise other taxes. And the idea of capping taxes and making taxes predictable went out the window. So within mere decades, the zakat system ceased to constrain rulers governing under Islamic law on either taxation or the reach of government. And before long, taxation turned out to be whatever the state could get away with. In fact, there were taxes that were imposed that actually literally meant whatever the state can get away with. In the 17th century, the leading source of government income in the Ottoman Empire is a tax called avariz. That means the liter what it means literally in Turkish is whatever the state can get away with. Okay, so it's essentially the state was calling its main form of taxation arbitrary taxation. Now, thus far, I've said why sustainable constraints on government predation did not emerge through Islam in the seventh century. I haven't explained, of course, why these constraints didn't emerge later, why you didn't have a movement in, say, the ninth century or 10th century or later, why, or the 17th century, when people were paying so much out of their pockets uh, uh, arbitrarily, uh, uh, why they didn't get together and uh, try to constrain uh, the government. After all, you had arbitrary taxation in Europe, and over time, taxation became less arbitrary. Why didn't, why didn't similar movements emerge in the, uh, in the Middle East? Well, other institutions explain why groups that suffered from predation and from arbitrary taxation remained unorganized for centuries and therefore incapable of advancing the rule of law. So this brings us to the second economic institution that shaped the Middle East political uh, trajectory. The wealthy who decimated the zakat system through loopholes were left without protection against arbitrary takings, only for couple of decades, they, of course, enjoyed the, uh, the exemptions, but eventually this, uh, uh, this uh, backfired. They began searching for a new way to protect their assets. And the result was the inclusion in Islamic law, the law of the land, a century after the emergence of Islam, of the waqf, which is a distinctly Islamic form of trust. A waqf has an endowment whose income is used to provide a social service in perpetuity. An individual sets aside some income, uh, decides what, how the income is going to be used the way you would if you set up a trust today. You set up a trust to put a child through, through school. You you file, there's a, there's, a, there's a procedure for this, you put aside the resources, you appoint the trustee, you explain exactly how the resources are to be uh, used. This is exactly how uh, the WACF uh, worked. Uh, the social service had to be provided in perpetuity, though, this was important. An Islamic college, you see the facade of a uh, Islamic college, this one is located in Iraq. This would be maintained through income generated by the assets of a waqf that was set up uh, for it. Now, the waqf protected property rights through the common belief that waqf assets are sacred. This belief made rulers reluctant to confiscate waqf assets. Why? Because they didn't want to develop uh, 
reputation for impiety. They wanted to raise resources. They went after private property rather than the assets of these trusts. Wok founders and their families, and also their descendants, benefited personally from this shielding of wealth because the law allowed them and their descendants to manage these uh, uh, assets, the sheltered assets, uh, in return for fees. If a person founded a wok, he or she could appoint himself or herself as the caretaker and assign a very hefty salary uh, to himself or herself for that uh, service. It allowed the founder uh, also to designate the beneficiaries. Okay, so some of the assets that were set aside returned to them and their families. So when you set up a walk, if you did provide a social service, like you supported a, a college, you supported a school, you supported a mosque, you supported a hospital, but some of the resources, in fact, uh, could be a large share of the resources would uh, stay with you or it would come right back to you and uh, this would happen and uh, the resources would be, uh, uh, would be uh, sheltered. Vast private resources flowed into WAC serving many ends, uh, not just mo mosques and religious schools, but also non-religious services, fountains. You see the, the bottom floor of this building in, in Cairo that is still standing today. Uh, this is a water fountain. You had a hospital, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a primary school on the second floor. Inns for merchants were established as walks, soup kitchens, and the, there's a, uh, the list is uh, very long. Uh, the goal was partly, if not largely, to shelter assets from rulers. The share of real estate controlled by walks as you can imagine, grew over time. By the 19th century, depending on the location, between 25 and 50% of all real estate, that's all arable land, all urban buildings, were owned by uh, walks. So we're talking about a very, very economically, very important, very significant institution. The WAC's emergence in the Middle East coincides with the emergence of the corporation in Western Europe. The corporation is a self-governing organization that enjoys legal personhood that can sue and be uh, sued as though it were a person. Both the trust and the corporation were present in uh, the sixth century codification of Roman law. Each of these, the corporation and the trust, is suitable to providing public goods. The two regions, the West and the Middle East, that I'm now comparing, both drew on the Roman legal heritage, but they made different institutional choices and at roughly the same time. The Middle East selected the trust, decided to use the trust and brought it into Islamic law. The West adopted both the trust and the corporation, and the corporation ended up serving a much more important role. So why, why this difference in institutional choice? Well, in the, between the 8th and 10th centuries, when the waqf was being adopted in the Middle East, the Middle East had strong states, these states were strong in the sense that they were capable of enforcing a far-reaching legal system, Islamic law, every place they ruled, but they were also, precisely because they were strong, they were also capable of predation. So the Middle East made an organizational choice that was suited to a society with a strong state. The Waqf provides material security to its founder from a strong state and most of the founders were state officials who had become quite wealthy, okay? They were protecting themselves by establishing these trusts from the very state on whose behalf they were praying, okay? So this was that they were basically protecting themselves, their own families, from their own uh, predatory activities. 
in the now what about the West in the aftermath of the demise of the Western Roman Empire, Western Europe had weak states unable to enforce law and order, so an organization emerged to compensate for the absence of enforceable law. The corporation supplies the means of self-governance. So canon law is used to provide, provide law and order within the church. You have urban law, you have guild laws, mercantile laws, and, and so on. They all uh, provide uh, self-governance in an environment where the state is uh, weak. So the West adopted the trust as well, but uh, the trust played a much smaller role in European economic history than it did in uh, Middle Eastern economic history. For a millennium, the WAC served as the vehicle for functions met in the West through corporations. So Western universities, like the early universities, including Oxford and Cambridge, were corporations. They were self-governing organizations. Their Middle Eastern counterparts were all, including Al-Assar, it's still living today, operating. In fact, its status has been elevated by the, by the brothers in the last uh, uh, year or so now on basic laws. They have to consult uh, Al-Assar. Anyway, this religious... Uh, uh, college uh, was established as a walk and it continues to uh, operate as such. In the West, practically all urban services were provided uh, primarily by local governments or municipalities that were chartered as corporations. In the Middle East, practically all urban services were provided by walks. Churches and mosques both supplied a range of public goods. Churches did this as corporations, mosques did this as walks. Now, given that walks came to control vast resources securely, they might have become powerful political players. They might have constrained the state by resisting actions that are harmful to their constituencies. And the resulting decentralization of power might have placed the Middle East on the road to democratization. After all, in Western Europe, cities and guilds and universities and churches organized as corporations served exactly that function. <coughs> they constrained the powers of central governments. This didn't happen, this didn't happen easily. Of course, there were, there were a lot of uh, struggles along the way, but these they did. The point is that these corporations became agents of democratization. However, for all of their wealth, WACFs remained politically powerless because they had to deliver specified services according to fixed instructions. Their capability to use resources for political ends was also more limited. An incorporated European city or European church could participate in politics a walk was not allowed to uh, to do this, okay? And a walk a walk was monitored by the Islamic courts that would not allow it to depart from its uh, uh, from the stipulations in its deed if they had to do with uh, politics and specifically with. Uh, politics that would uh, uh, challenge the powers of the central government. Uh, caretakers were not accountable, caretakers of WACFs were not accountable to their constituents, to the beneficiaries of the services they provided. The caretaker of a madrasa, of an Islamic college, was not accountable to the students or the faculty. The beneficiaries did not participate in any way in governance. There was no regular channel for communicating constituent preferences to the caretaker who was controlling the resources. So in the pre-modern Middle East, the suppliers of social services, of public goods, did not constrain sultans, nor did they foster political movements or ideologies. We have a term that refers to associations that stand between the state and the individual. Uh, 
at least since Tocqueville, the great French thinker, political scientists have viewed a strong civil society as a barrier against uh, a barrier to despotism. So what makes a country's civil society uh, strong? First, there must exist freedom, the freedom to found non-governmental organizations of one's choice. This is something the Waqf did provide. You see a charitable con complex or the uh, remnants of a charitable complex on the, the screen. The founder of this charitable complex decided himself that he wanted to found uh, a charitable complex as a Waqf. He could have instead established a mosque or, or done something else or established a school, he, he uh, decided to provide uh, uh, a complex that would serve the, uh, the poor. He was free to select the objectives of this waqf and also he was free to select the employees and beneficiaries, okay? Second, so this is something the waqf did that. Second, for a strong civil society, you have to have organizational autonomy. The organizations that you establish must have the power to act in their own interest. This is something the WACF blocked. The requirement to keep the objectives and the procedures of the WACF forever fixed tied the hands of caretakers as long as they tried to stay within the law. Okay, It denied WACF's self-governance, and this kept WACFs from becoming a political force for democratization. And thirdly, for a strong civil society, uh, the administration must be representative, but the constituents uh, and the, the constituents of, uh, of non-governmental organizations must in some re meaningful sense have control over the, the officials who are acting on their behalf. But the caretaker of a waqf, as I said, was not accountable to his constituents. And his constituents had no say, in his, or say over his selection and had no say over the, the person who would be selected uh, uh, next. So if democracy arose in the West, generating the desirable characteristics that are now picked up in global political indices, this is not because of benevolent kings and queens. Democratic rights got established through epic struggles that were driven by groups, organized usually as a corporation, within universities, within cities, as religious orders, as unions, as merchant associations. These groups demanded rights. They articulated requests. They developed ideas for alternative orders. They stimulated intellectual life and their successes gave rise to rules, regulations, and laws conducive to protecting rights and strengthening civil society. So there was a virtuous circle. As civil society developed, it put in place rules that facilitated the creation of private organizations. And this gave private organizations more uh, uh, security to protect the emerging uh, democratic order and to advance it. In the Islamic world, there was a vicious circle. The lack of waqf autonomy kept civil society weak. Strong private organizations could not be founded, so absolutist rulers were less likely to be challenged from below, and political checks and balances were less likely to arise. Given the enormous economic significance of the waqf, its failure to become a self-governing unit played a role here. It left the Islamic world without politically influential social structures between the individual and uh, the state. Now the figures on comparative political development in my second slide pointed, you'll remember, to high corruption in the Middle East this is a pattern to which the choice of the trust and the spurning of the corporation early on contributed. Waqfs are meant to be rigid organizations, as I've said. Over long time periods, changes in prices and technologies 
created a demand for reallocating the resources. When adaptations could not be made within the law, losses occurred, which of course created incentives to break the law. I want to focus here for a moment on the cases where caretakers acted on these incentives and got around the restrictions. When reallocations took place, it usually took place through acts of corruption. Changes were made with authorities looking the other way or bribing the judges. The judges were watching these, were monitoring these organizations. They knew what their deeds were. They knew what uh, an adjustment that was not recorded in the deal was, and they had the power to block it unless they were bribed. And often the caretakers simply took the easy way out and bribed them to make the uh, adjustments. These acts contributed over the centuries to the development of a culture of corruption. Breaking the law became common and acceptable. Bribing judges to make adjustments in the curriculum of the school or the procedures of, of a hospital became very common and became very became accepted because people understood that this was so pragmatic and uh, that it had many uh, uh, many benefits to society. To a degree, of course, we have accepted law breaking in every society. Jaywalking breaks the law. Uh, Many of us do it all the time, and it doesn't automatically generate criticism from the people who watch us uh, jaywalk. But in the pre-modern Middle East, circumvention of the law took place in many more contexts involving far more uh, resources. And remember, again, that the walks played a very important role. From cradle to grave, people benefited from walks. People of, of all walks of life benefited from services supplied by uh, walks. A byproduct of the culture of corruption was to raise the cost of making and enforcing laws. Where laws are commonly evaded, it's relatively hard to get people to obey new laws. Since everyone breaks the law, the act carries no significant stigma and enforcement is costly. Consequently, laws that are enforced at low cost elsewhere don't get enforced. Traffic regulations, rules against littering, tax laws are openly flaunted in the Middle East even today. This is partly because for centuries, circumventors of laws have enjoyed greater, uh, much greater tolerance than uh, uh, say in, in Western Europe. Starting in 1908, it became possible for Middle Easterners to form corporations under new local laws. The functions of walks were taken over by self-governing municipalities, professional associations, and charities. Still, checks on executive power remain limited. Approximate reason is that states over the past uh, decades, past few decades, have been committed to controlling and undermining private organizations. Dictators in the Middle East have spent decades emasculating the news media, suppressing intellectual inquiry, and banning political parties. They've spent decades also co-opting regional, ethnic, and religious organizations to silence dissenting voices. But one reason for their successes is that they faced weak civil societies to begin with. Coming into the 20th century, they faced weak civil societies. Forming politically effective uh, private organizations takes time, and the Middle, in the Middle East has had barely a century to do so through autonomous organizations. The West, the West has had a millennium and a half. Civil society provides the checks and balances <laughs> necessary for a self-sustaining democratic system, but it also serves other functions that receive less attention in scholarship and popular discourse, 
Civil society promotes a culture of bargaining and compromise. It endows citizens with the skills to form coalitions and govern. It gives future leaders the skills to articulate ideas and communicate them to diverse groups. It helps turn individual grievances and individual ideas into social ideologies. By and large, the recent Arab revolts have lacked strong leaders. There's been no Arab Nelson Mandela or Václav Havel, and the revolts have not generated new ideologies, let alone coherent new ideologies. And that, too, I would suggest, has deep historical uh, roots. Meanwhile, states themselves remain weak in that they're unable to enforce laws. There's massive tax evasion. A basic reason is that the concept of legal personhood did not become a part of Middle Eastern legal systems until the 20th century. It arrived in the early 20th century with the corporation. So when interactions with organizations, whether private organizations or public organizations, citizens tend to rely on personal relationships with employees or representatives. Nepotism is very common also. Relationships with government agencies are commonly viewed as personal business deals with the officials that one is uh, dealing with. This makes it difficult for states to implement policies. It makes it difficult for states to monitor their uh, employees. Of course, nepotism and corruption exist in the West as well, but there's a difference in degree, and that's what I'm trying to explain, and that's what the statistics, for example, the Transparency International statistics uh, show. A final historical reason why the Middle East remains largely undemocratic, and I'll go through this quite uh, quickly, uh, this has to do with the commercial sector. Traditionally, profit-making uh, uh, organizations in the uh, Middle East were tiny and short-lived. Here's the size distribution of commercial partnerships in the first half of the 17th century and in blue and the second half of the 17th century in red in Istanbul. At the time, Istanbul was the commercial hub, uh, leading commercial hub in the Eastern Mediterranean. We see here is, is the size of the commercial enterprise on the horizontal axis. Two-person enterprises, three-person enterprises, four and five are larger. And on the vertical axis, we have the percentage of uh, the percentages of uh, companies of this size. Uh, the main takeaway here is that the vast majority of the companies are tiny. They're two-person enterprises. Typically, they're established just for a few, uh, a few months. Uh, this is the 7th, 17th century. The Industrial Revolution is over the, uh, the horizon. Uh, at this time in Europe, overseas trading companies, large companies with many uh, with dozens, hundreds of uh, shareholders, eventually thousands, are being formed as perpetual organizations. Uh, in the Middle East at the time, commercial companies with five or more members were rare, and even these relatively large organizations, the largest in the 17th thousands of uh, commercial contracts that I've, uh, that I've looked at from the period in the records, the largest company I've come across is one that had 23 members, most of them investors, and they were in the deal for uh, a few uh, months. So uh, what we see is that companies are, uh, are very small and they last for a very short uh, time. This pattern lasted until the 19th uh, as a century. This pattern uh, uh, was due to two Islamic institutions. Uh, any member of an Islamic commercial partnership could pull out at any time. 
the partnership's premature dissolution by one partner imposed costs on the others. So for this reason alone, merchants and investors had reasons to keep their, these partnerships small and short-lived. The other institution that kept enterprises small and ephemeral is the Islamic inheritance system. The Islamic inheritance system is highly egalitarian by pre-modern standards. Uh, it divides an estate among all members of the deceased person's uh, family. A sudden death forced the remaining partners, a sudden death of a partner, member of a commercial partnership, forced the remaining members to deal with the heirs of the deceased shareholders, and they tended to be quite numerous, okay? So people kept their partnerships small and short-lived to minimize the probability of dealing with heirs and dealing with many heirs. The persistent smallness of enterprises and their short lives had serious political consequences. Tiny and ephemeral Middle Eastern businesses could not bargain collectively with the state, as their much larger counterparts in Western Europe did in centuries leading up to the Industrial Revolution. Politically weak commercial and financial sectors could not strengthen property rights. Arbitrary conf confiscations of private property remained much more uh, common, and one of the reasons is that uh, property owners were uh, poorly uh, organized or not organized uh, at all, and the reason for that is that these uh, the private companies were very small and short-lived. Uh, you can't establish a uh, strong and persistent movement if your constituents, the companies, are not going to be around for more than a few uh, months. Uh, and if they're tiny, of course, it becomes harder to organize them. Uh, these uh, small companies could not contribute to making states accountable to the public. The public. So let me uh, sum up and reconnect with the present. My question was whether Islam accounts in some way or in some ways for the commonness of authoritarian rule in the Middle East today. I've said yes, but in a special sense, Islam has mattered historically through institutions that were identified with Islam that were integral to Islamic law. Specifically, Islam's tax system opened the door to arbitrary taxation. Islam's alternative to the corporation, which is the Waqf, which is a rigid organization and is barred from politics. It kept civil society in the region uh, weak. And the commercial sector's persistently atomistic structure contributed to civil society's uh, weaknesses. The recent Arab revolutions have brought to power Islamist parties that are committed at one level or another uh, uh, with some variations internally to reinstituting Islamic law, or in other words, the Sharia, does my argument suggest that Arab countries are necessarily going to go backwards politically, at least as measured by the political indices I gave at the outset? Well, not necessarily. Very few Islamists want seriously to go back to a world without corporations and with only tiny companies. They're quite comfortable with the Western-inspired commercial and financial reforms of the 19th and 20th centuries. In fact, they've made some Western institutions their own. There were no banks under Islamic law in the past. A bank is a corporation. It, uh, 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 at least the banks uh, today in the Middle East uh, are, uh, and uh, they have an indefinite uh, existence. They can outlive their, uh, their shareholders. Uh, there was 
nothing like this under Islamic law, uh, nothing, no bank in the region, indigenous bank until the 20th century. Now they're not only banks, hundreds of banks, but Islamic banks. So they've actually, you know, uh, appropriated the, uh, the concept and made it integral to, uh, to Islam. So Islamism is not going to delay democratization through the economic agenda of the uh, of the brothers in Egypt or the uh, or uh, the other Islamist uh, regimes, the economic infrastructure for a potentially healthy civil society is in place, and that's unlikely to be wiped out. The danger is that many Islamists, especially those known as Salafis, want to deny people various social freedoms and religious freedoms that people in mature democracies take for granted. Post-revolutionary Arab governments have rushed to tighten anti-blasphemy laws, to broaden their applicability. These threaten expressive uh, uh, freedoms. And Arab civil society does not yet have the checks and balances that will keep Islamists from acting on their plans to restrict freedoms, various social freedoms. The effects of the past the past that, I, that I've described, weigh on them just as they weighed on the secular, or relatively secular dictators that they toppled. Mubarak was able to repress Egyptian society because civil society was very weak. There weren't obstacles to his arbitrary rule. Well, the same situation continues. Civil society remains weak in Egypt. If you look at the demonstrations, there are not many organ demonstrations against the brothers these days. There are not many organizations that are represented there. There are individuals who are uh, acting uh, on their own. The demonstrations uh, are uh, relatively uh, dis uh, disorganized. And Islamists are not more prepared to respect democratic norms than the secular politicians that they're replacing. And that is, I think, where the key danger lies. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take some questions or listen to comments. One here. What about the curtailment of basic freedoms? I think uh, Olivia wants you to take the, the microphone. Okay, you mentioned the seeking to curtail basic freedoms. How does that fit in with Sharia? Is Sharia open to having uh, basic freedoms? Is this an interpretation or? It's, it's quite controversial. There are certain freedoms that the Sharia definitely uh, does not uh, grant. Uh, it does not grant the freedom to, uh, to mock the religion, to mock Islam, or for that matter, any uh, religion. On the other hand, uh, it, uh, it does, under many interpretations, it allows the freedom to interpret the religion. Islam is a religion that gives every individual the freedom to interpret Islam. The danger is, the danger that we face now is that using these blasphemy laws, uh, Islamist politicians will be able to suppress legitimate objections to their policies on the grounds that objections about the blasphemy. That's where the danger lies. And of course, there's there a wide range of opinions among Islamists themselves as to how these blasphemy rules, blasphemy laws should be interpreted. Um, you were talking about um, the economic institutions within uh, is, uh, Islamic uh, governments and countries. Um, but also, isn't the Middle East also a, um, 
a major center for commerce and trade uh, due to its uh, location. Um, what's the relationship between uh, Islam and foreign trade uh, and commerce institutions? Okay. Uh, so uh, Islam uh, has, in fact, uh, well, the Middle East has, in fact, uh, been at the crossroads of uh, trade in uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, all the trade, the east-west trade passed through uh, the Middle East. Uh, Islam supported that trade through uh, the commercial provisions of Islamic law. Uh, in the Middle Ages, in no ways was, uh, were the commercial and financial provisions of Islamic law uh, inferior to the, their counterparts in Western Europe, or for that matter, in China, which was quite advanced for uh, the period. Uh, commerce has continued to be legitimate in the region. The problem is that these institutions, the traditional institutions of the religion cease to be efficient as technology of transportation, the technology of production uh, 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 changed. So Western Europe developed more advanced commercial institutions, uh, more advanced organizational forms for uh, organizing credit uh, relations, and the Middle East did not uh, keep up. The uh, commercial infrastructure of the Middle East and its financial infrastructure essentially stagnated until the 19th century. Since then, through various reforms, Western commercial institutions and financial institutions have been brought to uh, the, the region. These are now, uh, even in the poorest countries in the Middle East, you have, uh, you have banks, you have laws of corporations. So uh, the region uh, has the infrastructure for becoming quite prominent in commerce as it was in the past. But it has to catch up. It's uh, capital accumula private capital accumulation outside of the oil sector is starting from a low base. Uh, oil, the uh, availability of oil has distorted incentives in many, many countries. They have countries like S Saudi Arabia, have very little incentive to uh, de become uh, uh, develop a major commercial sector outside of, uh, of oil. So uh, the only bright spots in the region where you have competitive commercial sector, globally competitive commercial sectors are in places where you don't have any oil. So you have you know, major commercial success stories in Turkey to a degree in Tunisia. Uh, these are places that are, or these are oil importing countries. Just a very simple question regarding Islamist banks. Uh, yes. I'm the daughter of a Middle Eastern banker. Yes. And growing up, I always used to hear the fact that you know most of my father's clients did not want any interest paid on their deposits. Has that changed as far as uh, well, bank, Islamic banks? Islam, according to the dominant interpretation, Islam bans interest. Just as the many interpretations of Christianity in the Middle Ages, Christianity uh, bans and considers interest uh, uh, sinful. Uh, in the Middle Ages, both Islam and Christianity, in fact, uh, tried to ban interest-based transactions. Uh, neither succeeded because there were so many there were incentives for people to borrow and lend at interest. Uh, 
and uh, there were easy ways for circumventing the ban on interest. Eventually, in Western Europe, the ban on interest was uh, the, the notion that religion bans uh, interest, that uh, taking interest uh, provided the rate isn't too high or giving interest, that this is sinful, was abandoned. This never happened in the Middle East. Credit markets, however, up to modern times continued to operate on the basis of interest through various ruses. So the ban on interest, the notion that Islam bans interest, and the fact that this is still the dominant interpretation across the region, did not prevent from people, people from borrowing and lending according to what any economist would call cause interest. So the problem with uh, with the financial sector in the Middle East historically, and the reason it failed to develop, is not that Islam has banned interest. The, f the problem is that banks did not emerge. Credit relations, until recently, until the 20th century, credit markets were dominated by small uh, by small uh, financiers, individuals lent to other individuals on a small scale. That is, that works for small scale uh, uh, lending among friends, uh, for making consumption loans. It doesn't work for uh, industrial uh, uh, loans uh, in, in the modern world where companies have to borrow on a very, or want to borrow on a very large uh, scale. That requires organizations we call banks that pool resources on a large scale, on large scale. Banks did not emerge organically in, in the Middle East have to be built in the 20th century according to Western models. They have been very widely accepted because they are very useful. In fact, when the first banks were established by foreigners in starting in Turkey and Egypt and Iran and Iraq, towns that didn't have bank, bank branches sent delegations to the headquarters of the banks and said, please open up a uh, branch uh, here. So they, they were, banks became very popular. They're very well accepted in the region, even as people continue to believe that interest is, is sinful. The people who take it quite people who take it very, quite seriously that they should not borrow, they should not receive interest on their deposits, they should not uh, borrow at interest are dealing now with what are called Islamic banks as opposed to conventional banks. Islamic banks do business, do finance, uh, supposedly, or they claim to be doing uh, business, to lend money uh, without charging interest. In fact, what they do is, as they call their, what they charge, borrowers, commissions, and fees, and, and so on, and they're basically equivalent to, the, it's basically interest under another name. But it ends up satisfying very pious people who would like to, uh, who prefer not to be receiving uh, interest. I didn't mention in my talk interest restrictions on interest as an important factor that affected uh, the political developments in the region or economic developments because I don't think ultimately uh, they played an important role. Symbolically, Islamic banks are important, the ban, ban on interest is important, but, uh, uh, but uh, people f find uh, ways around the ban quite easily. 
Uh, you mentioned specifically 1908 as the time when corporations were allowed, and it seemed not just in a particular country, but the Middle East, and it seemed like it was a, must have been a watershed moment, so could you talk about that a little bit? Well, 1908 was uh, the year of, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, the Constitutional Revolution. So you had, uh, and it was uh, a revolution that ended up toppling the, the Sultan, uh, and the revolutionaries were secular, uh, were essentially secular officers or former officers who were secular. They were westernizers, and in 1908 they put in place a series of reforms. They felt that you needed an alternative to the walk. They saw the walk for some of the reasons that I, uh, that I gave you as a source of backwardness. They thought, saw the corporation as an alternative. They wanted to put in place checks, what we would call today political checks and, and balances. And for that reason, they they uh, essentially, essentially imported a law of corporations, and other countries in the region then followed suit. Egypt, several months later, and then other countries in the region over the next uh, couple of decades. So that is, in fact, uh, a watershed uh, a moment. It uh, the. Uh, groups that uh, brought about the revolution of uh, 1908 uh, had, had been struggling since about 1850. They were first organized then, so it took a very long time for them to actually achieve this, uh, this success. Uh, <clears throat> there seems to be a relationship between democracy and size of government. Uh, for example, the more democracy, like the Western European democracies, and look at our own country, seems like the more pure democracy we have, the larger uh, power ends up in the government and the size of the government so, and so forth. In the Middle East, I mean, democracy is not an end in itself. It's a way of governing and setting rules and providing what needs to be provided. So um, in the Middle East, Islam has, in, I think, uh, I would suggest, has provided a lot of the services normally provided by government. It was, you know, it's a very individualistic society. Uh, the citizens are obligated to take care of their extended families, you know, not to pass it off on the community or whatever. So I'm wondering uh, uh, if you are advocating, you know, democracy just for the sake of democracy or is that would that be will more or be a good thing or it, it depends it, will it depend well, you, you're raising a very uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, question now the very form the many different types of democracy uh, of course and as you say some of them have led to a larger and larger government with uh, all the ills that that, that involves. Uh, the WAC system that I talked about was in the Middle Ages, initially when it was founded, it was in some respects a magnificent system. People are supportive of uh, markets, uh, of uh, 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 market-based economies, and people who are supportive of broader freedoms they are, advocate, they are advocating a renewed emphasis on walks for providing services as opposed to uh, uh, the government. They're supporting a decentralization. 
The catch is that the walk that they are supporting, that they're pushing now, is actually what we would call in the United States a charitable corporation. They are a nonprofit organization. Walk laws in many countries of, of the Middle East, including the countries that have undergone revolutions, have been revised. Walks now, even the, though the term is the same, they're still using the medieval uh, word to describe these organizations, they have far more uh, powers and they're essentially self-governing organizations. This, I think, even though it doesn't make headlines, I think, as I said, is an important development because it will gradually strengthen civil society in the Middle East. And if we're going to have uh, uh, sustainable democracies, stable democracies eventually, if freedoms are going to be protected, we need a strong we need in these countries strong civil societies. And this development, I think, is quite, uh, is, uh, is a good one in that respect.